on this panel, we'll have uh, Brendan, who you just heard from, and then we'll have three additional participants who cover this gamut. So we have Peter Akersley from uh, Partnership on AI. He leads research there, and he was formerly part of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, we have Andrew Trask, uh, who leads him, and he leads this project called Open Mind, which I mentioned at the start, that the Rice Foundation has uh, supported financially. And then uh, we have Morten Dahl, who's a cryptographer, and he focuses on um, uh, a project called TF Encrypted, and he's also a research scientist at Dropout Labs. So, uh, Andrew, over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Nathan. Um, so, um, today uh, we're going to be talking about um, what it means for privacy technologies to uh, kind of go mainstream. So, obviously, we talked about lots of interesting sort of new techniques, especially in cryptography, uh, machine learning, uh, privacy research. Um, and so what we, we, we have here is sort of a cross-section of, of experts that Nathan uh, just introduced who can really speak to different aspects of this story. Um, so first, I would like to sort of ask uh, Peter a question. Uh, can you just talk about how um, privacy technologies have you seen in, in sort of shepherded privacy technologies becoming mainstream adopted in the past? Uh, so I've seen a mixture of things that have worked really well and things where it's been a huge struggle. Um, uh, at EFF, there were a few major areas where we pushed um, privacy technologies and tried to get people to adopt them. Uh, one of those areas, uh, which was a, honestly quite frustrating and a bit of a disappointment, was the, the predecessor to these uh, differential privacy and, and federated learning techniques I think that we're talking about now. Uh, sort of 10 years ago, um, we were looking at problems like location privacy uh, for uh, like public infrastructure systems, like road tolling systems, uh, or uh, uh, services like friend finding services, or uh, phones even. And all of our efforts to explain to the world, hey, there are, there, are, there are algorithms you can use to both have software know where you are and also not have the provider of that software or the engineers making that software know uh, that data. Nobody understood that that was possible. And we, were, we sort of had a chicken and an egg problem where we couldn't persuade, say, a, you know, a government agency that might be putting out a tender for some piece of infrastructure to, to write into that tender a call for you know, uh, some uh, fancy uh, cryptographic technique that wasn't available in the market yet. And mm. so it feels like uh, this is changing now, perhaps with GDPR and with the, the advances that are being made in, in uh, ML privacy methods, um, that, that frustrating era uh, might be different. But there's, there are other stories where we, we pushed privacy enhancing technologies and encryption deployment was, was one where I think we, we pushed hard and we got a lot of successes over a long period of time that like, wound up looking really, really impressive in retrospect. So, so why, why did you have more progress in encryption deployment than you did in, in other areas? That's a great question. Um, it, it felt like in some ways, um, things were ready. And so uh, when we made requests to companies, um, whether you know, there, there was a day when we were sitting around uh, with EFF's lawyers and Google's lawyers saying, uh, and I was like, why is search not available over HTTPS? Every time you type in HTTPS www.google.com, you get redirected back to insecure HTTP. Um, and there was sort of some awkward mumbling on the Google side. They said, we'll, we'll get back to you. And then they came back like three or six months later and said, oh, actually, we can do this. And I think what had happened in the background was like a, a lot of uh, work that um, folks like Adam Langley and Evan Roseman had done at Google at the time to, to scale mm -hmm. the, the TLS deployment such that you could flip that switch for a reasonable cost. And so there's both political pressure that's necessary and technical infrastructure that's necessary. OK, so, so um, there was technical infrastructure, technical maturity that you mentioned. And you also mentioned sort of awareness and sort of just visibility of the technology exists. Um, so, Morton, uh, you've been doing quite a bit on secure multi-party computation. You're leading TF Encrypted. Um, given that lens, can you talk a little bit about where is secure MPC? What is it useful for, first? And two, um, how, you know, where does it compare to kind of this? Well, this I think there's definitely several similarities. You're also mentioning in, in your presentation now that um, there's this awareness around it. So making it uh, non-magical and actually explain to people that it exists. Um, it was also mentioned earlier today that it's very cross-disciplinary, so you need to have machine learning researchers, data scientists, engineers, and cryptographers talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And so far, that's been happening somewhat in the silos. Um, and to actually bring these people together and understand what they're saying, find the right use cases. Um, mm -hmm. So coming back to performance, as you were saying as well, um, we've so, seen... So awareness is the main thing that we're working on at the moment, or...? 
I think the maturity of the technology is, is increasing. It's still not there. Um, there was some work out from Google recently where they were describing how they were using this in practice, mm -hmm. uh, some of the constraints that they have when you're actually employed in the real world, uh, the scalability issues and so on. But we are starting to see some of it. Um, but yeah, so performance, uh, awareness. Is everyone here familiar with secure multi-party computation? Should raise your hand if you've come across it. Um, OK, give us, give us a quick high level, what is secure MPC? Just before so the secure aggregation that we just saw is a, is a small specific example of secure computation. And generally, secure computation allows you to compute on data while it's encrypted. So you can take an, a ciphertext, an encryption of something, and you can somehow manipulate that ciphertext into another result mm -hmm. without actually being able to decrypt that and then potentially send it back. So and why is computing unencrypted data useful for privacy? So you can imagine in the machine learning setting that, um, there was one of my favorite examples is this group of, of researchers that a few years ago used TensorFlow to build this uh, skin cancer uh, um, uh, image detection. So you, everyone they basically had a mobile app mm -hmm. where you can take a, a photo of a skin lesion mm -hmm. and it would analyze whether or not you'd have that further inspected. Mm -hmm. And they, they did that by basically uh, turning a large network on a lot of, of data and so on. And if you were to put that into production, uh, hosting that on the cloud and the service, mm -hmm. um, people might be might be want to use this because they now have an expert dermatologist in their pocket. But at the mm -hmm. same time, they're having a risk of uh, essentially telling this company or the cloud server um, whether or not they have skin cancer. So they might right. not be incentivized to actually use this service. Okay. So coming back to the deferred learning as well, that you can kind of you can shield who can actually see this data okay. in the process. So so secure MPC not only could lead to more adoption of technologies that are involved with private data. Um, but also better protection for, for users in the process. I see it as enabling certain things from both from the perspective of the company that wants to train this model, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, they run less of a risk. Maybe they have access to data they didn't have access to before. Okay. Uh, you can imagine devil parties that have several data sets, and now they want to join those data sets, but without revealing the data sets. Right, right, right. But also the end user, that you can incentivize people to actually use um, your services afterwards. Very cool. So, um, um, Peter, uh, and then we'll, we'll jump to federal learning as well. Um, just given what Morton has said, like like what what's the delta that we, we that's sort of standing between where Secure MPC is today, the level of awareness, the level of maturity, and the level of awareness and maturity that you've seen when other technologies kind of reach that tipping point to mass adoption? That's a great question. I, I, I think it makes me realize that one of the, the, the there are maybe even three things that you need. You need the tech to be ready, you need the awareness, and then you need some kind of pressure for adoption. If using a technique is going to be costly uh, in terms of engineering time or performance, something has to be forcing you to do that. And um, it, in, in some cases, with encryption deployment, that was activism mm -hmm. by groups like EFF. Mm -hmm. But um, in other cases now, it can be privacy law. And the fact that there are certain types of applications that you just can't build or deploy or shepherd past the, the lawyers in your organization without uh, having this toolbox. So it feels like we're probably getting quite close um, as we see like these these tools landing in li like clean library form and there are tutorials now mm -hmm. it feels like oh we should be like about to see significant large-scale deployments of these methods so it almost sounded like there also might be commercial interest to drive privacy work I mean, one of the things you mentioned was that if you can say you know provide a, a cancer prediction service without ever seeing individuals' data, more people will be inclined to use the service, that, that's good for business, right? Yeah. And that's assuming that rule, regulation like the GDPR solves some of that okay. the policy or political piece. And I think that's maybe an open question. Uh, it'll depend on how the GDPR is very complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and it could be interpreted eventually in a lot of different ways that are stronger or weaker. And so if we end up with the stronger but still sense-making <laughs> versions of the GDPR, <laughs> then like that's the environment that creates the richest uh, uses of these methods. Interesting. So regulation, instead of necessarily trying to kind of um, uh, maybe slow down or curtail innovation, is really just setting up the right foundation so that incentives are aligned correctly. Cool. Um, so uh, Brendan, um, you just gave us a great tutorial uh, and explanation of federated learning. Um, where, where It seems like federated learning is a bit farther along in this story than, than maybe Secure MPC is at the moment. There's lots of adoption, obviously. You're deploying this to hundreds of millions of people at Google. Um, um, what, what phase are you in of, of deployment? Um, what's sort of the next step? Yeah, let's see. So in terms of what phase we're in, I think you know, we, we have deployed it to, to great success in a few different applications. I think we'd like to push that out. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in many cases, to get to new applications, like new research is needed. So I, I think we're at the stage where we're trying to grow okay. uh, the set of, uh, of problems we can solve with federated learning. But the, the 
ease of use of the technology is a, a major consideration. So I mean, a lot of what our team is, is actually doing is just software engineering to make it easier to use federated learning. I okay. mean, there's been a lot of work for a lot of years from a lot of people like, on like building easy, up. Easier for consumers or easier for developers? Right, easier right, for... right now, easier for developers at Google. Okay, uh, okay at Google. Right, because, you know, you know, there, there's very mature tools for, for doing machine learning on in, in the data center uh, yeah. from a bunch of different places. And so that's kind of, in some sense, the competition. That sets the bar. And we have to at least be um, reasonably close to that for people to consider using the technology. So there, there's a slide I have that I really like, but I, I couldn't quite fit in. You know, you can kind of draw. Big slide. Yeah, yeah, big slide. <laughs> <laughs> you can draw kind of a Pareto trade-off curve between privacy and utility. Mm. Uh, and, and that gives you an interesting tool to talk about pushing the whole frontier out, which I think is what I think of technologies like federated learning um, and secure multi-party computation doing. Yeah. There's a separate set of questions where regulation, policy, a bunch of considerations that are much more domain specific come in, which is where on that curve do you want mm -hmm. to be? Yeah. But there's a third axis on that, which is really how much work does it take to get to a particular place on the trade-off? <laughs> and it's easy to forget about that one, yeah. but in terms of adoption, I think that's one of the biggest ones. So oh, wow. that's awesome. Certainly with the stuff we're doing internally and, and starting to do externally with things like TensorFlow, Federated, mm -hmm. uh, just ease of use of, of these technologies is a big goal. What, what is like a timeline would you say is, is a point at which federated learning, actually both of you for this, and Secure MPC would be ready for the typical external startup or enterprise to, to, to pick up and try to deploy with? Are we, are we looking at like you know, six months or is there a library already out or are we, are we years out from this? What do you, what do you think? Do you want to go first? <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say we're still, we're starting to see some, but at this point it needs to be either special cases where you, where you can somehow afford to pay maybe the extra computational cost of, of actually the price of running the instances for this, um, or where it's not uh, on a regular basis you have to do it, on a daily basis, but maybe once a month you have to use these techniques. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say it's still a bit further out. Um, okay. And we're looking more at, at specific cases where this makes sense. Okay. Um, which is also one of the things that, that so the, the pre, three properties we already have. I think another one is that it shouldn't necessarily be black and white. It shouldn't be mm -hmm. that tomorrow we say, everything has to happen in the encrypted space or using federated learning. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more a question of saying, we have a process that's already in place, can we take uh, bits and pieces of that and try to add um, these techniques to actually make, improve that or to have more data and so on. Okay, well actually in light of that, maybe, maybe a more nuanced question then. What are some, what are some early use cases um, or maybe new, new applications that, that previously were inaccessible that the technology in its current state can, can activate. Things that, that people here or, or online might either interact with as a consumer or, or you know, do, do a, a business or an enterprise around. I mean, so there's definitely something around uh, having, we've seen use cases on this in deployment in, in practice, um, mm -hmm. where you're taking different data sets and you can somehow combine them and then you can do, um, there's been auctions being done on this. Uh, there's okay. been uh, and, and combine them and where like so multiple different people combining their data where in the encrypted space, so in the encrypted, in the form, encrypted form, and then right. use the kind of the joint data sets uh, to improve whatever they want to do. Um, Interesting. That's happened already. Um, there's been a few cases outside of machine learning mm -hmm. where we are taking where people have been have taken a, a problem that that's already somewhat well understood, mm -hmm. but provided uh, in this case a software alternative for what was before a hardware um, solution. Okay. Oh yeah, like encrypted hardware. So, so that makes it more attractive, right? You already know what, you, what problem you're trying to solve, now you just have a better solution for it, solution for it that doesn't require hardware, that's more scalable and so on. Okay. Um, so there's another question for the group. Um, in general, so we, we talk about privacy as kind of being the goal, but often privacy is actually a, a proxy for things we're really trying to achieve, like uh, accountability or transparency, fairness, safety, security, these kinds of things. And, and privacy can actually lead us in, into feeling, you know, we have a, a world that's sort of more, a, a world that actually is perhaps more equitable or more, more distributed resources, these kinds of things. Um, but it strikes me that, that fairness, uh, accountability, these are not necessarily technical problems, but we are bringing technical solutions to them. Um, um, <laughs> And so I'm, I'm quite curious to hear um, what, what is the real gap? How do we make it so that when we, when we, we implement federated learning, implement privacy preserving technologies, that we actually get kind of some of the, the social benefits that we're particularly interested in um, with, with these algorithms? Uh, this question bothered me a lot in my, my time working at uh, EFF on privacy because uh, when you look at privacy and try to think about it philosophically, for some people, emotionally, it's a, a goal in and of itself. But really, 
uh, it makes more sense as a, a, a mechanism for protecting people against bad social norms, bad legal rules, uh, like powerful actors that are trying to do things that are contrary to their interests. And so the reason we want privacy is, is for this type of protection of human beings. And in the United States context where we were working, uh, an organization like EFF could build privacy tools, we built lots of them, um, uh, get people to use them, but the people who used them and benefited from our work the most tended to be well-informed kind of cypherpunk technologists who were paying attention uh, to things that EFF shipped, and we, you know, we had millions of users uh, or, or more, but uh, they were not the same group of humans that, if you look at U.S. society, are suffering the most intense privacy harms. Uh, if you do an analysis there, it's probably uh, most severely uh, like people who are caught up in the criminal justice system, uh, mm. uh, who you, like y young, like very often African American uh, or other minority uh, men who are uh, subject to a really intense surveillance. Um, and w with really extreme problematic consequences uh, that look quite unjust. And so when you say, oh, well, how do we help these people? Mm -hmm. Well, we don't have a, a, like an easy way to get them to use fancy like, software that we, we use. So one of the places that we tried to push on that was to aim for defaults. If you could change the way that everything worked, um, if you could ch change the default uh, way that mail servers exchange mail to be encrypted, if you could mm -hmm. uh, change the way that uh, your browser just by default connects to websites so mm -hmm. that they're encrypted. The thing we, we never managed to change is change cell phones, mobile phones, so that they don't report your location the whole time. <laughs> um, then those would be really big structural interventions against that problem. Hmm. I, guess, I guess the other place that you see really high stakes unsolved privacy harms is you know, the, the, the debates around uh, unintended consequences of social media newsfeed optimization hmm. is another type of like, high stakes privacy harm that I don't think we've fully wrapped our heads around or, or figured out how to tackle. It strikes me that um, you've been working on a very powerful default. Yeah, I think I think kind of privacy by by default is one of the things we we, we care a lot about. I think mm -hmm. we want to make it make it hard to do something that's privacy unfriendly, right? Yeah. I think that's that's one example of that is it's kind of baked into TensorFlow Federated. Like mm -hmm. the we have operators like Federated Mean, which are naturally amenable to mm -hmm. provide they provide some privacy in, in some sense immediately, and mm -hmm. they're amenable to adding stronger guarantees mm -hmm. like secure aggregation and differential privacy. So we, we make it very hard for you to materialize a single user's <laughs> yeah. kind of value mm -hmm. on the server, right? The default way of doing things is using general purpose aggregation operators mm -hmm. that, um, that that combine data and can offer some privacy. That's so I think I think that is uh, essential to kind of advancing things. We need to make it easy. Fantastic. Um, more than anything that uh, you think could be sort of secure by default, leveraging secure MPC or? No, but I definitely, I, I'm not sure what by default there should be. There should be, maybe it's more on the accessibility of this thing. Okay. Uh, there is Crazy. a lot of parameters, a lot of technical things, questions around applying this stuff. Um, that should have good defaults that makes it more accessible. So is it, is it fair to say that actually maybe providing it as an option and then as a default is like a standard standard uh, sort of growth pattern for these kinds of things? Or, or was it more binary in your experience? Um, very often option than default. So okay. with HTTPS deployment, definitely um, most of the platforms that we were pushing, you know, Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Wikipedia, lots of others, we, we kept nudging them and saying, can you improve this thing? And it, we first got an optional HTTPS deployment and then got a default one. Mm -hmm. um, the exception was we also did work on, on mail server to mail server encryption. Uh, so there's a, a handshake uh, thing you can do called start TLS that encrypts uh, messages traveling between mail servers. And with that one, um, it was so easy for people to turn it on that all we had to do was, was publish a scorecard of the top 20 or 30 mail domains uh, saying which ones were doing this and which ones weren't. And the timing was good because it was like a little bit after the Snowden leaks and everyone was like kind of incensed about privacy. But we heard back within, within six months from maybe five of the top 20 mail domains saying thank you so much for <laughs> publishing this scorecard because we got just enough management buy-in to flip this switch. Hmm. And I, So I guess that in, in those cases it was optional. Like it had been buried in the ismail server mm -hmm. uh, implementations for decades that you could do this uh, mm -hmm. and it just wasn't it, it wasn't turned on okay. so so i guess many people here work at uh, sort of very large um, sort of enterprises if you're interested in championing privacy within your own organizations i hope that this is sort of a, a useful cross section there are various privacy technologies that are out there there are varying levels of maturity as we've talked about um, and the best thing to do i think is to champion an option for privacy uh, in your own organizations first 
uh, and then look towards maybe sort of once people can kind of feel things out, risk is mitigated, technology stack is sort of matured, um, you can go for maybe more of a default option, which is pretty yeah. cool.